All right, everyone, we'll get started here. For Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Um, I will uh, share some introductory information before we get started. So uh, welcome to the University of Texas Energy Institute Energy Symposium for April 7th. Uh, we are now online and virtual with the COVID uh, crisis, uh, but moving forward, um, as normal here. So we have a great talk for today and thank you for all for tuning in. Uh, next week will also be a good talk. So next week's uh, symposium uh, speaker and title is listed here on the screen. So April 14th, same time, 1230. Uh, we'll have Joseph Tainter, who's a professor of ecology and environment and society at Utah State University. The title of his talk will be what energy transitions tell us about water management. If anyone is familiar with uh, Joe's work, it's stems in the area of uh, societal complexity, the use of resources and energy, and uh, impacts on water, and the attempts to build out society to access more resources, including water and energy resources, as populations grow and put pressure on the environment. So he's an uh, anthropologist, and he's done a lot of studies linking natural resources to the organization of society. So it promises to be a very good talk, and I'm glad he will join us, uh, in this case, remotely. Before I introduce today's speaker, I will point people out if they're interested in tuning in to future energy symposia for this semester. The events page of the Energy Institute will list the talks uh, as shown here, and we'll have links to the Zoom webinars uh, or meetings that occur. So uh, we see today's listed and uh, the one listed for next week as well. So you can go to the energy.utexas.edu slash events, and you will see the energy symposia listed on that page. So today's talk is by uh, Tim Latimer. Uh, the talk will be the potential of geothermal in our clean energy future. So uh, Tim is a founder and CEO of a local geothermal company, Fervo Energy. Uh, so he has experience in his career in the, in the drilling uh, industry. Uh, and in the oil and gas industry. So he's applying that knowledge uh, to the field of geothermal and he'll give us some insights into the current situation in terms of the oil markets and how that might play into geothermal energy. And so I'm glad that Tim is joining us today. Uh, this is a little bit more of his bio. Uh, he's worked as a consultant for the Boston Consulting Group and for Biota Technology and McClure Geomechanics. Um, and he is a fellow of the Clean Energy Leadership Institute and was a Forbes 30 under 30. So uh, congratulations, Tim. Um, and so without further ado, I will announce, I will switch it over to uh, the sharing to Tim. And I will note to everyone that we will be, uh, what, what Tim would like is if people have questions during the talk, uh, you can try to type into the Zoom chat. And uh, I will interject and ask your question from there. Uh, we can also hold questions to the end uh, where you can type them in or we can attempt to ask them by uh, voice as well. So uh, feel free to type a question as we go forward and uh, we will, I will interject and Tim will ask it from there. So uh, with that said, I will now pass it over to uh, Tim. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Um, great. Well, I guess I'll start by figuring out if I can share the right screen. Ah, here we go. Host disabled participant share screen sharing. So Carrier, Alexis, I don't know if one of y'all can uh, uh, change my privileges here so I can. Got it. Go for it. Okay, let me try this again. Aha, success. Okay. Um, all right. Well, hopefully you can see the the first slide is just the Fervo Energy logo. So that, that'll be a good test. If, if you can see that, then Hopefully things are, are working and I appreciate everybody bearing with me as we uh, all try new formats and new ways of working. I would have very much loved to have given this presentation um, in person, but I'm, I'm really glad that the UT Energy Symposium was accommodating and able to make this a, a virtual presentation so quickly um, and, and still, you know, keep, keep it going. Um, but quite a bit different than what I was anticipating. Uh, try, to, try to make the best of it. I will, will encourage, like I said, um, active conversation in this would be much appreciated. So if you do have a question, you know, just submit something into the chat so Carrie can see it and, and flag it and 
we can, you know, ask your question directly or, or if, if, if possible, have um, you actually do a, a video or, or a question over the audio here, which would be great. Um, and, and we'll try to get into it. And, and like I said, I'm very appreciative of the opportunity and also of y'all uh, getting together so quickly on being able to make this a, a Zoom presentation since we couldn't do this together in person. Um, so with that, I'll kind of kick off. And, and before we really get into what Fervo Energy is doing and, and um, the, the comments I want to make around uh, the opportunity for geothermal energy, and, and also um, Carrie had suggested that I comment a little bit on, on the price of oil and current um, energy thermal. So I've got some slides at the end for that. Just wanted to tell you a little bit about my personal background uh, and how I came to be here today. So I um, uh, grew up in Texas, actually from a small town near Waco. So um, not actually too far from the University of Texas. Uh, and I went to college at the University of Tulsa, studied mechanical engineering, first job out of school, started working as a drilling engineer for BHP Billiton. And so first jobs were actually out as a rig site supervisor for um, our prospects, first in the Eagleford in South Texas, and then in the Permian Basin in West Texas. And it was a quite interesting time to join the oil and gas industry. Um, really maybe one of the oil, most interesting times you, you could have possibly joined it because it was right at the time when a combination of technologies, um, you know, specifically horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing really changed the landscape of how oil and gas was produced and what it meant for, um, you know, the, the oil economics, what it meant for global energy and, you know, had all kinds of uh, disruptive, uh, you know, follow on impacts and, and um, working as an engineer in that, in that, in that industry at the time um, when the pace of innovation was so quickly was, was quite an interesting way to start my career um, and met a lot of good people there and, and really enjoyed my time. But what I found is the more I got into my career and the more I started thinking about uh, and learning more about climate change, the more I decided I wanted to spend my career, um, you know, focused actually in a different direction, you know, still, still focused on energy, but was, became more and more passionate about finding ways to apply my skills to clean energy. Um, and so when I started surveying what the clean energy economy looked like, um, I looked at myself and really the only skill I had at that time was um, poking deep holes in the ground, the skills I'd acquired in the oil and gas industry. And I wanted to find a way for that to fit energy and fortunately I stumbled into geothermal where I learned that the wells for geothermal are drilled and operated a lot like oil and gas. Um, you know, in geothermal you drill down deep wells but you're just producing steam instead of uh, oil and oil. Um, and so I thought it was a great match for my skills and the more I dug into the industry the more I realized that even though there had been this amazing technology uh, innovation um, that had occurred in the last decade as, as horizontal drilling became the primary way we, we drill for oil and gas in this country, that a lot of that technology had not actually transferred to geothermal. Um, and the more I looked into it, the more I saw that I think there were some real possibilities that people had overlooked about um, specifically horizontal drilling uh, and how it relates to geothermal reservoir production. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit in my presentation. So with that in mind, I decided to quit my job. I went to graduate school at um, Stanford where I got an MBA from the business school and also an MS from the School of Earth Sciences where I focused on both studying climate policy but also uh, did some more technical classes in terms of reservoir and geomechanics and how that worked and really spent my time there trying to hone in on, okay, um, this abstract idea of taking technology from the very sophisticated oil and gas industry and applying it to develop geothermal in a new way, how do we actually put that into practice? Uh, and fortunately, by the, time, by the end of my um, two years at Stanford, uh, we'd worked through a lot of the technical questions, could develop what we thought was a really sound go-to-market strategy, uh, a way that delivered projects with attractive economics. And importantly, I met people like uh, my co-founder, who's uh, Dr. Jack Norbeck, who's our CTO now, who had done his PhD at Stanford on um, horizontal drilling and, and looking at how uh, reservoir and geomechanics actually work for geothermal reservoirs. Um, and so we got pretty confident in this approach being transformative for the geothermal sector and launched the company um, a little over two years ago out of Stanford. Uh, since then, we've been fortunate to be supported by uh, folks both in the research uh, and grant funding community, as private venture capital, um, this, specifically the Cyclotron Road program at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which has allowed us to provide early funding and, and also get grants along the way from both RPE and the Geothermal Technology Office that has been very supportive of Fervo Energy's new approach to geothermal. Uh, we've also been able to close uh, 
uh, private sector funding from a few different venture capital groups, uh, including Breakthrough Energy Ventures, uh, which is a billion dollar clean energy fund uh, set up by Bill Gates and others to try to invest specifically in companies that can have a game changing impact on, on climate change. Uh, and so we're, we're now up and running and to a point where we're working on some different field tests and pilot projects for our technology and working on validating uh, a lot of the technical feasibility work we've done at, at locations in the Western US and, and also around the world and are very excited about um, the prospects for geothermal and, and for, for many reasons. One, its impact on climate change and economic development, but another one that's important to me personally is its ability to tap into the skill set uh, of the oil and gas industry and look at the uh, amazing work done in project management and geology and reservoir engineering and apply it to something that is gonna be a major part of the clean energy transition. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons why I'm so excited to speak at the University of Texas today, um, given the University of Texas's um, long track record as being one of the premier research institutions in, in geoscience and reservoir engineering and everything that has to do with uh, resources in the ground and getting it out of the ground. And I think that that makes it really a, a really unique place to look at geothermal. And, and uh, there's a lot going on actually at the University of Texas that's very exciting in the geothermal space. Um, Y'all may be aware of the Geothermal Entrepreneurship Organization, GEO, that the University of Texas launched last year, which is actually looking to capture a lot of the skill sets and research in the university and launch a, a set of, um, use it to stand up a set of technologies and companies that could be really impactful in the geothermal space. I think Jamie Beard is likely on on the call today. So hi, hi Jamie, and <laughs> appreciate the work that you're doing within the UT community. And it just underscores how important it is to me for Fervo Energy and the rest of the geothermal community to be working directly with the University of Texas and very excited to be here. Um, so that's a bit about my background and just wanted to provide an intro of, of who I am and, and got, how I got to be here today um, before we dug into the presentation. Um, but I'm, I'm really happy to tell you more about Fervo and, and geothermal and and kind of get into the history, of, not the history of geothermal, but you know some of the development challenges of geothermal and why it's uh, historically been limited to just a few places and, and why we feel it can be a truly scalable resource um, for, for here and beyond. So I'll get into this here and uh, let's see. So just to start off, kind of as I mentioned, uh, Fervo Energy brings technologies that enable the North American shale boom to geothermal for the first time to economically recover um, to increase the economically recoverable resource by orders of magnitude. Um, and specifically horizontal drilling and some of the work we're doing on distributed fiber optic sensing is, is the things that we think are a, a, a part of a suite of technologies that will let geothermal be far more repeatable and far more scalable than it's done, been done before. Uh, and specifically the uh, geothermal resource that we think is accessible in the near term in the United States is at least 100 gigawatts. And this is a number we've done from our own analysis. Um, it's also been verified by the Department of Energy. I would encourage people to check out the GeoVision study that they released last year that laid out a roadmap for how technology can, um, can increase the geothermal resource base to a very meaningful amount. So 100 gigawatts, I think, is a good minimum target to shoot by for 2050. But te technically, and, and from a resource standpoint, we actually have the potential to do a lot more than that just in the US and, and, and um, even more globally. But even 100 gigawatts alone would be a very, have a huge impact on the energy sector. Um, given how reliable geothermal energy produces, that could be something like uh, 15 to 20% of overall electricity. Um, it, in that, it, 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 uh, it in itself would be a huge market opportunity, somewhere around $300 billion or more in terms of the value that that would provide to the economy. Um, and and uh, and specifically because it's a clean energy resource, using that to replace natural gas or coal in the U.S. electric system would offset over half a gigaton of um, CO2 emissions per year. So it's a major prize, um, and one in which I think we really have the technology and the right marketing conditions to begin pursuing at this time. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the technology context for geothermal and and. Uh, if you know about geothermal, you know that you might know it as something that's limited to very specific geologic settings. So frequently people, when people think of geothermal, they think of Iceland and New Zealand. Um, I also would want to bring your attention to Northern California. California is a place that gets 6% of its current electricity from geothermal. Um, so it's a big part of the resource mix, but also countries around the world like Kenya. Kenya is an interesting case where 
they had almost no geothermal installed a decade ago, and they've been able to bring up so much geothermal onto the grid that it now count, accounts for over half the electricity supply um, in, in the country of Kenya. So it's been really a fantastic story from an energy access standpoint and a climate ac- and a climate change standpoint to bring so much of this clean energy resource online and, and there. And, and that's true around several countries around the world. But um, if you look, all of those places, whether it's Northern California or Kenya or Iceland, have very special geologic conditions that allow them to develop that. And I'm going to talk a little bit on this slide about how geothermal works and why why you really need these special geologic conditions to make it work and and what some of the major barriers are. So if you look at the slide that I have here, geothermal typically works by drilling deep wells down into hot parts of the subsurface. Uh, And you drill a set of injection wells and production wells and you traditionally pump cold water down the injection wells that filters out across the reservoir and returns as hot as as hot water or steam through production wells. Um, and it's a resource that can last for decades. It, it produces no, it's, it's got a lot of attractive qualities, but it's been very important to scale this resource specifically because um, it's really challenging to develop the resource up front due to exploration risk. So globally, the number is around 40% of all geothermal wells are unsuccessful. Uh, and if you think about these wells, that's a major problem for investors and for development because drilling one well to these depths and these conditions is a multi-million dollar investment. And doing that with a hit rate where you're not even getting um, your money back on two thirds of the projects you do has been a really challenging thing um, for the industry to overcome in terms of it being a truly scalable resource. And also that one-off nature has kept it from being something where you can apply kind of the mass manufacturing learning curve that has helped when solar batteries come down learning curve so quickly. So if you want to actually scale geothermal, the biggest area you have to attack is this exploration risk. How do you get to where you can drill wells more consistently and get a return on those wells more consistently so you can improve the project economics and also turn it into a repeatable process where the magic of a learning curve can come in because you're doing the same project over and over again. So if there's one thing you take away from my talk, it's, it's that you, this is the one area within geothermal that we really need to address successful and, and bringing its cost down and make it a scalable resource. It's the exploration risk. And the reason that happens is really because of a couple, uh, two, two main causes. One is low flow rates. So if you look at this diagram, you drill these injection and production wells in areas that hopefully have a significant number of, of natural fractures that can support fluid flow. And when it's successful, that fluid is, is that fluid flow is what provides the amount of time you need in the subsurface and the volume and flow rates you need to actually bring up economic amounts of steam. But not every well actually intersects enough areas to actually be able to pump into it the way this diagram shows. Um, the other problem is thermal decline. So one thing that can happen in geothermal reservoirs is if you drill wells that are too close together or if there's one flow pathway that overcomes the rest that flow can go straight through and 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 you can immediately cool the reservoir so it doesn't work for decades like it's supposed to it may only work for weeks or months in which case it becomes really challenging economically so these are really the two things that you need to address if you want to make geothermal successful so i spoke earlier about 100 gigawatts being the number that that we support and the department of energy says is what we should really be developing in the u.s by mid-century um, and there's technology and policy and economic barriers to get there. But generally, if you want to boil down the economic and technology barriers to three, the three most important things, um, this is what, what, what we feel is on this slide. From a well productivity standpoint, I talked to you before about how the lower the reservoir permeability, um, the lower the flow rates, the more challenging the economics are. Um, if you want to reach this resource, you need to figure out a way to consistently achieve 80 liters per second of flow rate per production well. From an asset life standpoint, you need to create geothermal reservoirs that can last at least 20 years or longer. Um, I can tell you there's many examples of geothermal reservoirs lasting much, much longer than 20 years. Some of the first plants that were installed in Italy, New Zealand, and the United States have now been in operation over 50 years. So this is very possible, but you need to figure out how to do it repeatedly across many different areas. And then finally, cost efficiency. You need to be able to drill and complete well systems at a cost of less than $5 million per well. Um, These are the three metrics I think are the most important. And if we can do this, that 100 gigawatt resource goes from being a vision of the future to being a reality we can develop today. So the technology Fervo Energy is working on to implement this 
is really bringing the first ever horizontal multi-stage design to geothermal and using it to overcome these issues of expiration uncertainty, flow rate uncertainty, and, and um, getting enough efficient heat exchange in the subsurface to have these reservoirs last for a long time. And what you hit, see here on the left is a reservoir simulation that we've conducted um, that shows three wells in a geothermal system. And this is looking from the top down in this view, where you have two cold injection wells that are returning fluid flow to the surface. And then, uh, sorry, one cold injection well that's, that's injecting cold fluid into the subsurface. It's flowing out from that central well into two offsetting hot production wells and returning to the surface as, as steam or hot water. And this is gonna be the first ever horizontal multi-stage design done for geothermal. And it really overcomes a lot of these barriers in terms of uh, the flow rate and the thermal drawdown that you need to have economic projects. It, it can achieve the metrics I put before. And fortunately, because of the major technology advancements, specifically in the world of horizontal drilling and, and drilling efficiency that have occurred in the shale revolution in the United States over the last decade, um, you can actually do this economically at, at costs that are achievable um, that hit the metrics that I put on the slide before. So this is a system that can actually deliver on the major technical hurdles you need to have a scalable geothermal system in the mix. Um, the solution we've developed is really underpinned by advanced reservoir and, and geomechanical computational modeling that, that was begun at Stanford University and now carried on by our team and with some of our key partners. Um, but it also incorporates several innovations, um, some we've developed and some that are leveraged from the oil and gas industry to actually get um, drill these wells with, with high repeatability and, and really understand what's happening in the subsurface. So in addition to directional drilling, we're also working on major advances in distributed fiber optic sensing with some partners and in a project funded by RPE to actually allow us to measure in really high resolution where the fluid flow is going even when it's tens of thousands, even when it's thousands of feet down in the reservoir. Um, and so this is the solution that, that Fervo Energy is working on. And it has a lot of advantages over traditional geothermal, and I've kind of put a bit of a side-by-side -side comparison on here. And one of the factors is um, the amount of reservoir contact. And, and th this really translates into actually having an efficient system that can last for those decades and the zones that you have. The other thing that's really important is by drilling horizontally, you remove a lot of the uncertainty in the subsurface because rather than trying to get flow out of what might only be a seven inch hole drilled down in the ground vertically, drilling horizontally thousands of feet gives you so much more opportunity to get the right kind of flow rates you need once you've already drilled down to those depths. So this is really a step change and compared to how traditional geothermal has been done, which is historically vertical wells and, and really relying on on hopefully intersecting just a few areas, even with this narrow vertical well, drilling horizontally gives you a, a very different picture in terms of um, in terms of your ability to develop, and it's what allows us to address many of the challenges we've had that that I talked about in the earlier slides. Um, so those are the technical barriers, and and I've told you about how we feel that we can overcome them and actually scale a resource that. Can be a huge part of the part of the electricity mix. Um, but yeah, want to talk a, a question? Little, absolutely, love questions. Thank you. Uh, here's one from the, the yeah. chat. Um, does do the does the technology you're working on uh, also enable lower temperature areas to be economical, or are you still targeting certain high temperature areas? Yeah, that's that's an excellent question. And if you think about geothermal around the world. Um, the question of temperature is really a question about economics, really not about technology limitation at all. And so for producing geothermal electricity, you can see uh, plants around the world from as low as maybe 70 degrees C in the extreme case, up to as high as 300, 350 C or higher. So there's a huge range of, of temperature that, that can be applied. And if you think about what goes into a power plant output, it's a function of the amount of flow you have times the amount of energy in that flow and how much of it you can convert to useful electricity. And so the question for lower temperature resources is always, can you get, the, can you get enough fluid flow out economically to make it worth, worth extracting even though it's a lower temperature, low efficiency resource? And so again, this is not necessarily a technology limitation, it's more about cost. And so the lower drilling costs go and then the better our facilities at the surface are at taking that low energy geothermal, sorry, that low temperature, low energy geothermal and converting it to electricity, the lower we can go. What 
um, Fervo Energy believes, based off our technical modeling, is the right temperature resource that gives you the biggest bang for your buck using today's technology in the Fervo design is in the range from 175C to 225C. Um, and that's what the sweet spot where you've seen most of the new geothermal in the United States be developed in the last decade. And it's also a temperature where you get a nice trade off between not having to use extreme high temperature components in your development cycle, but still getting some good fluid flow out of the reservoir. Um, I think there's really promising things that are both above and below that temperature range. I think one of the things that Texas Geo is focused on, the, the University of Texas organization I talked about earlier, is much higher temperature supercritical um, systems. And those have the advantage of getting way more energy density uh, out of it than, than the lower medium temperature fluids. And I think that's a really interesting path to pursue. And I'm very excited about the efforts going on there. And then you can go down to the extreme low end of the spectrum, and there's some really exciting technologies that are getting a lot better at taking that low to medium temperature reservoir fluid and converting it into electricity efficiently. Um, and the company I might flag there is one called Climon. Um, uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures is an investor in them, the same fund that's backing us. And they have a specific technology that's really good at converting temperatures from 120 C and even lower to electricity. So the short answer to that is that it's an economic question. It's not really a technical cutoff. And I think that Fervo sits right in the, the medium sweet spot of that range, where I think there's a lot of good resources we can develop using today's technologies at attractive costs. But there's some really exciting things going on in the field of geothermal, both above and below that, that, I'm, that I've got my eye on. We've got another one here, which is, I guess, on the technical side, but might be uh, related to your economics. Sure. Uh, yeah, so this is a, you have a knowledgeable uh, audience here. I, I figured as much when I, when I agreed to talk at the University of Texas. So. Right, right. They got a lot of people yeah. from, the, from the geosciences school or, and engineering are, are listening. So uh, fractured rock is difficult to drill, and you can have losses of drilling fluid into zones and breakouts. This can cause jamming of drill bits and things, and you're also drilling into hard rocks. So do you know anything about, do you need better kinds of drill bits or drilling fluids that are specific for some of the reservoirs you're going after? Yeah, so for, for what we're, we're doing, there's a lot of work in terms of hard rock drilling just in the last decade that we can take advantage of. Um, I can point to different things like service companies. There's a new bit called the Chimera bit for anybody who's a real drilling person out there. Uh, that's kind of a hybrid bit between a traditional tricone roller bit and a PDC bit that has some of the advantages of both. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting is hard rock drilling historically has been only the, under the purview of, of tricone roller bits. And um, the newer bits, the major innovations in terms of PDC drilling that has been one of the key technologies to unlock the shale revolution, um, even a decade ago, didn't quite have the right hardness, strength, durability profiles for hard, hard rock drilling. But we've just seen a dramatic pace of technology and innovation and advancement and PDC bits to the point that we, we feel excited and, and comfortable about exploring the opportunity for PDC bits and, and hard rock drilling. So sorry if this is a little technical for the general audience, but wanted to be, be responsive to this question. So there's, there's more stuff than just generically talking about horizontal drilling that is important innovations in the last decade for us. And some of it come down to advancements in, in the drill bits and the drilling technology that make hard rock drilling easier. On the lost circulation side, that's one of the major barriers for geothermal development. And if you look at an analysis of non-productive time in drilling for geothermal wells, the biggest suck of time is actually dealing with lost circulation issues. Um, and this is one, again, where there's been some really exciting technologies, even on the high temperature side, that help mitigate that, different, different actual LCM additives or different ways of drilling that are important um, that I think is, is really interesting. And, and one thing that I'll talk about that is perhaps an advantage for how Fervo Energy wants to drill and the resources we wanna go after is that historically you have to have highly fractured, highly permeable reservoirs in order to make geothermal work economically. But if you start drilling horizontally, you actually give yourself so much exposure to the subsurface that the individual um, fractures and individual flow rates can be a lot lower in terms of their ability to take flow because you're averaging them out over across a you know three to five thousand foot horizontal well section or, or more and so as a result you don't need the same kind of highly fractured reservoir that you do in traditional geothermal and so lost circulation generally for us might be easier because we're just targeting formations that have 
uh, better reservoir properties for, for drilling. So there's, there's a few things to, on the technology side that excite us a lot about hard rock drilling. And there's also a few things in terms of um, the actual characteristics of the reservoirs where we think that, that um, using the technologies we're talking about are going to be a great fit. Uh, thanks. Go ahead and continue. Cool. I'll, uh, I'll tackle a little bit here. So first, just want to talk about where we are in the company cycle and, and what we're working on. So the first and most important thing is what we call the desktop validation phase, because um, there's many different things you can pursue within the world of subsurface or geothermal. Um, but given the fact that it takes many millions or tens of millions of, do of dollars just to do a single test system, um, you really want to be really intelligent about upfront using all the simulation engineering design and feasibility studies at your disposal to actually make sure that you're delivering a system that works. So the first couple of years of the company was really spent in this laboratory and desktop scale saying, do we have all the equipment we need whenever we used, uh, you know, fully coupled reservoir and geomechanical simulation models, can we actually drill wells at the right cost with the right temperature profile and flow profile to deliver on an economic system? And that also has been really informing for us in terms of, understanding what geologies to target, what reservoirs to target, what technologies are the most bang for the buck. And, and we consider that kind of phase one desktop validation study to be completed as of last year, where, where we really proved a lot of the answers needed from a simulation standpoint on whether this is an intelligent idea and worth pursuing um, and, and provides economics that are attractive. Um, the phase we're in right now, we're, we're right in the middle of, which is the field demonstration. So actually going out and testing the types of drilling and well completion technologies and the systems that we want to work at the field level um, and doing it to validate our modeling to say that actually the things that we go out and do in real geothermal reservoirs are, are backed up by our models and show that that works. And, and we're very excited about that. This is also going to give us an opportunity to test advancements and things like fiber optic technology that we've been working on. Um, through the RPE grant to advance in terms of measuring and mapping fluid flow. So very excited about the field demonstration phase of what we're doing. And, and we're actually, those tests are underway and, and really making good progress on them and will be concluded in the next couple of, of months here. Um, and then the important one for us is this next phase, which is a commercial pilot. So um, beginning at the end of this year, we're actually going to be drilling a multi-well drilling campaign um, uh, in the Western U.S. to bring new geothermal production online um, using this horizontal multi-stage approach and specifically using the, the technologies and techniques that we developed and tested in phase zero and phase one. Uh, and at the end of 2021, we'll be at a position where we've actually got a revenue generating commercial pilot that's the full scale system design. And that's the point when, when not only will we have this backed up by reservoir and modeling results, but actually we'll have uh, field results and even revenue generating projects to back that up. So we're very excited about that prospect and phase of the company. And then after that is when we feel we can start scaling quickly because we'll know the exact right geologies to target, the performance parameters needed, and we'll have a couple projects done with, with the right economics to show that this is a de-risk technology and, and one that's ready for, for prime time. Um, so I just wanted to give that to give a snapshot of, of where we are. Um, you know, we've, we've done a lot of good work, but is, as building any, you know, hardware, intensive technology company, um, there's a lot of work to go. And so uh, very much looking for the right partners, um, engineering talent, uh, you know, different professionals across the board to help us get through these two things because it's, it's quite interesting. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about market size and, and how this can be impactful and how we view this. Um, so the first opportunity we want to go after is what we call the infield opportunity. So if you look at the U.S. and around the world, there's several geothermal plants that um, are not producing at their full nameplate capacity. And there's also uh, areas near geothermal plants that, that using traditional technology have been uneconomic that we think that we can support doing economically. So this has the advantage of being shallower, they're well-characterized geologies, and our first set of projects are the ones that we wanna do at or near these resources. Um, and those are at depths that are relatively shallow that are already economic using today's technology and, and using the FERVO approach. So we're very excited about that. But it's a relatively small opportunity. And the plan after that is to step out into new areas. And one of the things that's important for us is we want to show that this horizontal drilling approach can be so uh, repeatable that we can bring the same kind of mass manufacturing technology uh, mentality to geothermal that has been so transformative in the shale oil and gas world and the world of solar and wind. 
And so doing this in similar geologies and doing it repeatedly where we can tweak and hone and rely on our engineering talent and our service companies and, and our partners to continue to improve things means that by the time we finish this infield phase, we think we can step out and do driller harder, deeper, more challenging projects and, and attack a much larger resource size, you know, not necessarily with any step change in technology, but just understanding and learning and adapting each step. Uh, and that's a pretty sizable market, 2,000 megawatts. So that's enough to be a meaningful percentage of, of the Western U.S. electricity grid and also one that gives us enough runway to really push costs down lower. Uh, and, and then ultimately, what we want to be able to do is, resort, re, is reach resource depths that might be on the order of 3,500 meters or deeper. Uh, and if we can get there, that's where we have basically an ubiquitous resource that we can bring online anywhere. And this is kind of how we will approach this doing the easier resources first and then working our way down the difficulty level to the point where we have really large resource sizes. And just to put um, some color on these numbers, uh, you know, my experience U.S. oil and gas industry um, in shale. And when I began my career there almost a decade ago, um, if you look at how drilling productivity is measured, the EIA tracks this through a metric called normalized rig productivity. Uh, in every basin across the U.S., we're actually 10 times more efficient today than we were even when I started my career not even a decade ago. Um, and so the pace of innovation, if you can show that this can be repeatable, is really, really um, profound in how quickly it can advance. And so I think this is a very, very realistic development cycle, um, just given the benchmarks of other industries that have done this exact same thing. Um, and we're also at a point where we're really fortunate in terms of the market conditions for geothermal. So if you think about the electric grid and our desire to decarbonize it, um, states and jurisdictions start with lower level targets. The renewable portfolio standards is the most common way to do this. And frequently you'll see states say, we're gonna do 10% or 25% or 33% at some time in the distant future. Um, and that really changed about two years ago when California and Hawaii and now several states started putting ambitious targets for 100% clean energy in their resource mix. Um, California passed the SB100 law in 2018 that said this, and it also put a really strict intermediate target in there that said that they actually need to get 60% of their energy from renewable sources by 2030, which is not that far away. Uh, and this is really important for geothermal because if you think about geothermal's key attribute, it's that, yes, it produces emission-free electricity, just like wind and solar do, but what's really unique about geothermal is that it produces 24-7, and it can produce in the winter and in the nighttime uh, clean electricity with no emissions and, and times when it's really challenging for other resources to do so. And so a bit as a result of these ambitious targets for 100% clean energy uh, and, and other intermediate targets, you've seen a, a large uptick in interest just in the last couple of years for geothermal. And just to give you one data point on this, from 2017 to 2019, a, a three-year period, there were only three total new power purchase agreements signed for geothermal in the entire United States. And just since the start of this year, in a three-month period, there's now been six. And that's because more and more you're seeing the corporate buyers, the utility buyers, the community choice aggregators that are in these places that have really ambitious climate change targets, understanding the need to complement their current resource mix with a resource that can work at night and it can, wor it can work in the evenings and can be dispatchable. Um, and so what you see is people are even willing to pay a premium price for this. So even though you can get solar in certain places now for really low prices, $20 a megawatt hour, or $30 a megawatt hour, um, people are willing to pay a significant premium for something that works 24 seven around the clock. So some of these groups that are buying solar and wind for $20, $30 a megawatt hour in, in that area are the same ones that are willing to pay $65 or $75 for geothermal contracts, um, just because it's value and being able to work 24 seven is that high. And so it's not just the states though, it's also really important to think about where our big corporate leaders are. And on the right, I've just put a snapshot of major corporations that also have 100% renewable energy targets. Um, and it's clear that businesses are increasingly viewing this as a competitive advantage. And I'll just flag a couple that are going kind of above and beyond. Um, one is Google, which is really interesting because a lot of companies do 100% renewable energy targets and really achieve it through RECs or accounting means or, or some other way of doing it, but not, don't necessarily time match the uh, amount of electricity that they buy with the amount of electricity that they use. 
And you've seen a company like Google step up and say, not only do they want to be 100% renewable from an accounting standpoint, but they actually want to match all of the electricity they consume instantaneous with the electricity that they um, buy and do it in a 24-7 carbon-free way. And they're the leader in the space, but I expect many companies to be copying them relatively soon because I think it can bring on a big competitive advantage. And that's yet another situation where geothermal really shines because if you're talking about trying to support a data center or a manufacturing operation or something else, the ability to provide round the clock electricity is, is something people are willing to pay a big premium for. Um, Let me, so, uh, there's a question here. I think you maybe just answered. It was fantastic. asking about PPA prices you might expect and uh, megawatts per well. I, I guess the numbers you stated were, were those representative of the uh, PPAs that were signed for geothermal? Yeah, those are representative for current PPAs signed for geothermal. Um, 60, and also, 65, was that 65? Yeah, 65 75 to 75. Dollars? Yeah, and I've got a slide in this in a little bit um, uh, that I'll talk a little bit more in pricing, especially with the impact of, of um, the decline in oil prices might do for our, our business where, where I'll get into it. But that's a good ball, ballpark to think about. Um, it could be lower or higher than that. A lot of it depends on the resource quality, but that's where you're seeing a lot of um, the new contracts signed today in the U.S. Yeah. Thanks. Go ahead. Oh, and in terms of megawatts per well, a good average number to think about is, is probably four or five megawatts per production well. Um, but that number can actually range from zero. There's a lot of wells that are zero. I told you at the beginning that 40% of geothermal wells are unsuccessful. And <laughs> that means there's unfortunately a lot of zero. And that's that's the the range you got to cut off. Um, and on the high end, some of the really productive wells that you find in places like Indonesia or the Salton Sea in Southern California, where you have really high well temperatures, it's not uncommon to have one individual well that might return 20 megawatts or, or even higher. Um, so it can be quite a range. At the temperatures we're going for, thinking about stuff that's in that um, four to five megawatt range for really high flow rates is probably the right um, average number to think about for a successful well. Uh, I'll just get on to team and partnerships uh, here for a second. And, and this is, I mean, really, if you'll indulge me to brag about <laughs> Vervo, and I'm very excited about the, the team we've built here. So I've, I've introduced myself and Jack, the, my co-founder, who, um, who did a lot of the really technical work underpinning this from a reservoir and geomechanics standpoint that really has charted the path for what we think is possible and what Vervo is working on today. But the other thing that we've tried to do with our team is really bring the best of the best in terms of renewable energy development, um, along with people who really understand shale oil and gas technology and what it actually took to get there. So a couple of people I'll, I'll highlight, um, uh, Banu Alkaya, our COO, spent a good chunk of her career with PG&E and also a hydropower developer in Turkey, but before that was actually a production engineer for Ara Energy, an oil and gas company in Bakersfield, California. So she wears many hats for us. And then we also have, have a good technical team in terms of Christian Grattle, our drilling and completions manager, who spent over 15 years with Hess and BP doing a lot of unconventional work where he really understands this technology. And I'll, I'll flag, you might like to know, he's a, a proud MBA from the University of Texas. So uh, he was very excited about uh, me coming to give this presentation today. And similarly, Eric Eddy on our team, our senior drilling engineer, really understands um, unconventional oil and gas development. Uh, but also has an interesting career where he actually um, at, at one point was working on an exploration project for a company called Encana, where he drilled uh, what we think is probably the deepest well in basalt, which is a really challenging hard rock to drill in central Washington that was over 13,000 feet deep. So brings a lot of hard rock drilling experience to the team, um, as well as Don Owens, our head of project development um, for where she'd previously been at East Bay Community Energy and NRG, where she led a lot of their sustainability platform and new project development. So very excited about our senior leadership team, I should say. Um, we're kind of always on the lookout for new hires as well as interns, and so both for technical and non-technical roles. So if I could put a quick plug in here um, for, for in, people interested in, in their career and looking at things. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to yeah, highlight was – oh, go ahead. There is a question here on exactly that. So what, oh, fantastic. What, what kind of skills would you be looking for, or specific majors, or is there anything that you think is needed in the geothermal space? Yeah, I mean, you can roughly, this is probably an oversimplification, but roughly bucket this into technical and, and non-technical roles. And, and we will continue to be building out our technical team and want 
really the sharpest people we can find from that background in reservoir geomechanics, geophysics, uh, the full suite of geosciences, everything that you need to do a successful mining and oil and gas project. You need to do that for geothermal. The only difference is geothermal is generally harder. <laughs> we've got hotter rocks, we've got harder rocks, we need to drill larger wells. So if you're somebody who's technical and is really up for a challenge and wants to think creatively, create creatively about how to approach these really challenging environments, um, we could definitely use those skills. And, and um, on the commercial side, I mean, there's just a lot that goes into de-risking projects and, and selling them. You think about um, selling a new power generation technology is a really challenging thing to do because it's something where reliability really matters, consistency really matters. And it's one of the reasons why it's highly challenging for new technologies to break in because um, the cost of failure is so high. And so selling somebody on taking a flyer on an unproven technology is really difficult. So if you're somebody who is non-technical, but you get marketing development, how to put a story together, how to think strategically, um, you know, how to, how to do the financial modeling and figure out how to make something pencil out uh, where you're really blazing a new trail, like that's certainly of interest to us. And I'll, and I'll say that um, we don't have any public positions posted as of this moment, but we generally, I mean, we've had now over a dozen interns that we've brought in throughout the three years that we've been at the company that have worked out really well and have been a very exciting part of the team. And, and we also will be um, looking to scale our full-time team um, pretty, pretty consistently throughout the end of this year and into next year. Um, so there will be a lot of opportunities for people across a wide set of skill sets. Uh, and lastly, just want to kind of touch on some of the partners we're working with. I've already alluded to things like RPE, who's funding our fiber optics technology, but this is not developing a new system like this with the complexity it entails, not something you can do as a small startup on your own. And so we've always been very diligent um, and reaching out to people and building broad collaborative uh, relationships to actually attack these problems. And this is just a snapshot of the people we've worked with so far, including the Berkeley Lab, um, Schlumberger, who we got funded on a geothermal technology office grant to actually upgrade. I talked a little bit about how geothermal wells are, they're hotter temperature wise and also bigger. And so upgrading some of the tools that are common in oil and gas to work in higher temperatures and hotter environments is, is very important. Um, we continue to do work with Stanford and especially on geomechanics, that same RPE project we're partnering with Rice University uh, and then the Menlo Park office of the USGS looking at seismicity and, and how you analyze it and how you incorporate that into safe project development has been a big focus for ours as well. And so we're very much of the philosophy that attacking a problem like this is not something you can do on your own and, and just continue to want to work with um, the best research institutions and, and corporate partners out there to make that happen. Um, so again, that was just to kind of tell you a little bit more about the Fervo team and, you know, potentially get a quick plug in there about recruiting and hiring and, and what we look for there. Um, so that's the general end of my presentation, but I think uh, Carrie had, had asked me if, if um, I'd talk a little bit about um, oil prices. So I've got a couple more slides uh, that actually get into oil prices and what I think that might mean for geothermal I can get into. I wonder if now's a good time, Carrie, or if you think it'd be better for us to pause and take a few, few more questions. Uh, there's uh, three questions on the chat uh, we could take. Let's, or, um, let's do it. Okay, one is about uh, fault reactivation. So have you thought about the geothermal energy developments on, on geologic fault reactivation and your heat exchanger designs given so much of the United States is in this three or seven, 70 to 300 degrees C range that you sort of uh, alluded to. And um, unknown faults can get reactivated upon water injection and circulation. And of course, uh, people have studied this in uh, disposal wells from hydraulic fracturing in Texas and Oklahoma. So any thoughts on geothermal and fault? Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I think just a general comment at the beginning is that uh, geothermal has a long track record of, of operating very safely and incorporating some of these risk factors into development. Um, and, and, you know, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing and we wouldn't be working with the partners we are if we didn't think this could be done uh, safely. And if you think about fault reactivation and especially what's happening in oil and gas, uh, the technical term for this is induced seismicity and it's something that um, any project developer needs to pay a lot of attention to and, and we're no exception. And, and we're fortunate that the U.S. has a really well-structured regulatory environment for things, these things, and that the Department of Energy is really the world leader in developing um, tools for this. And, and specifically, uh, they have an entire induced seismicity mitigation protocol 
that's applied to any geothermal project that is going to do anything that's that's kind of uh, non-standard or out of the ordinary that might need extra review. And that, that policy is is out there. It's very well followed. And, and this is an area where we know a lot more about fault reactivation and other things than we have before. And I think just a few that have come uh, in the last few years recently is one of them, the total volume of fluid injected is one of the things that uh, scientists now understand is one of the key metrics for um, for uh, fault reactivation and for the risk associated with that. And so one thing that Fervo does in our design and we're really important, I think is really important is, is actually limiting that to a very, very low number um, so that you're not exposing yourself to the same, um, you know, fault reactivation risks that are common in the oil and gas industry. Uh, and so there's different engineering tools we have. There's a strong regulatory regime and it's something that I think uh, I have full confidence that, that we can develop these projects safely and, and the research and scientific community and our understanding of what goes into this is, is in a very different place than it was a few years ago. Right. Uh, here's a, a related question, kind of a follow-up for clarification. Uh, is uh, mm -hmm. your the Fervo focused on induced fracturing or also relying on pre-existing fractures or is it both or how do you? It, yeah, I'd say, I'd say both is probably the fair thing to think about. The, the most important thing is, is the natural fracture system. And, and Fervo is no different from any geothermal technology, for any geothermal company that's come to date in the fact that we really rely on, on the natural reservoir system itself. Um, we just do so in a way that by drilling horizontally, we give ourselves uh, a, a much bigger margin for error and a much more opportunity to get high flow rates out of that system. But still by far the, the governing thing that dictates the performance of the geothermal reservoir is the natural properties of that reservoir itself. Right. Yeah. Uh, here's another one. Have you thought about uh, carbon dioxide as a working fluid? Or I think ways? that's a, I think that's a super interesting topic. It's not something that Fervo Energy is working on directly in terms of our early projects, um, but it's a technology that I think is really exciting. I think there's there's a few organizations I'd point you to, uh, one of which is an organization called Terraco, which is a company that's specifically working on using carbon dioxide as a working fluid for, for geothermal. Um, and, and I think that's a technology that's that's got a lot of um, ways to go. And, and in addition to all the other benefits I've already listed about geothermal in terms of having a low land footprint, being carbon free, working 24 seven, it actually has the opportunity to do, um, use CO2 as the working fluid, which can pull some of that CO2 out of the atmosphere. There's also really interesting projects, um, specifically in Iceland, where they focus on carbon mineralization. So if you think about carbon storage, frequently you're talking about storing carbon actually in reservoirs itself, but in, in its still CO2 phase. Whereas there's some interesting projects, um, one that had been completed in Iceland over the last couple of years that actually focuses on carbon mineralization. So putting that CO2 in the reservoir and having it solidify actually into the reservoir properties, which has the advantage of actually being a truly permanent storage solution for CO2. So there's several exciting things. Fervo is not working on them, but I'm very excited that others are working on them. And it's just one of the things I think is great. If you think about bringing on geothermal at scale at a really large level, then these complementary technologies um, can just increase the value and its climate potential even more by adding things like CO2. Uh, the other thing I'll talk about in this vein in terms of complementary technology is that people in California are getting really excited about now, including the California Energy Commission and, and a few of the big players there, is if you think about one of the most critical minerals for uh, the clean energy transition, Lithium is really high on the list. The, providing the amount of lithium we need for the batteries that go into grid storage solutions, the batteries that go into our electric vehicles is gonna be a really important um, part of the clean energy transition over the next few decades. And there's actually companies, um, I point you to one called Lilac Solutions that is working on directly extracting lithium from geothermal brines. And you're doing that now in a way where you're even sourcing that lithium from a renewable energy resource. Uh, and one that would otherwise be a waste product. So it's a very clean way to develop the supply chain. Uh, and the state of California and these startups are putting a lot of resources and money into that. And so one of the things that excites me most about geothermal is if we can get this to work and we can get it to scale, your ability to add complementary technologies to geothermal systems that can do things like use CO2 or extract uh, useful quantities of lithium um, can just be really complementary technologies that help accelerate the clean energy transition further. Uh, right, someone helpful here is saying carb fix, C A R B F I X is the Iceland project, and the similar approach was used in a Washington State project as well. Yeah, 
yeah, I highly encourage Carb Fix is a super cool company. Highly encourage you to check them out. Also to check out Terraco, T-E-R-R-A dash C-O-H. Um, and both on the, on the traditional CO2 as a working fluid side and on the carbon mineralization side, there's some, there's some really exciting things being done in the geothermal space. We got one more here before you can maybe uh, discuss oil prices. This is uh, helping your economics here a little bit. Do you expect any more funding from DOE? Are they writing some stimulus packages uh, now with the COVID crisis that are similar as the uh, Recovery Act in 2009? Or you, maybe yeah. you have some shovel-ready projects for them, right? <laughs> we, I, I think that it's really important. You know, you know, this is actually maybe a good thing to talk about. One of the biggest challenges with geothermal is just lack of awareness. Uh, and so I'll, I'm going to complain about it in a little bit when we get into pricing, but geothermal for the last several years actually didn't get the same tax credit that wind and solar did. Uh, and you think about uh, power project development, a lot of times you're highly competitive on price. And if one, and if you're competing with another renewable energy resource, they get a 30% tax credit and geothermal didn't get the same. It got a 10% tax credit. It actually makes it really, really hard to develop. And so if you look at what happened in what's called the ARA Act, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, and in the late 2000s coming out of that financial downturn, there were a few policies that were really important to scaling all renewable energy, re energy resources, um, including geothermal. Um, and it really is, I think, responsible for putting solar where it is today uh, in terms of being a truly scalable resource in the United States. And the policies there were extension of the tax credit to try to give a level playing field to renewable energy in these markets. Uh, and then another thing that's kind of wonky, but extension of something called the Section 1603 Treasury Cash Grants, which actually gave you the ability to monitor, to use those tax credits quickly, as opposed to having to go out and find a, a big bank to invest uh, on behalf of the project so they could take the tax credits from you. And those two policies coupled with the fact that the DOE loan guarantee program was very well funded and working quickly was, was like um, a big boost all across the board for renewable energy development. And I think that it'd be really intelligent to include similar policies in any upcoming relief or stimulus package that comes. And I mean, my only thing that I wanna make sure everybody's paying attention to is geothermal is, is, is poised to shine. And it could be a really big part of the solution. It could be a part of the solution in a way that puts the oil industry back to work, um, an industry that's going to be really impacted by this downturn. And it can be something that really helps us long term on deep decarbonization because it produces 24 seven. So I think it's really important that the stimulus um, uh, continues to include geothermal and, and makes it a big priority for, for the future. Uh, and then in terms of other DOE grants, the DOE is doing a bunch of really exciting stuff. A project I'd flag for people to check out is called FORGE, the Field Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy. And you can just look up Forge, Forge Utah, where the DOE's put up $140 million to drill a set of test wells at a spot in Utah where they think is going to be really great for doing experiments in geothermal energy. And it's been a project that's been almost a decade in the works right now. And it's, it's the, one of the most exciting things, I think, in any subsurface technology. Uh, and it's something that Fervo is really excited about. And and is looking to partner, collaborate with um, anybody, but at the very least, the technology results out of that. It's truly unprecedented. It's gonna carry the geothermal industry um, forward in a big way. So there's a lot of exciting stuff going on with the DOE right now, and that could just be bigger and better and faster if, if, the, if geothermal is included in the uh, stimulus package that, that may be coming down the pipeline. Okay, I guess we got uh, maybe one more here. You can do the oil discussion first or answer this one second or first, but this is just more on uh, induced fracturing. Do you have any concerns of social resistance that might be? Yeah, I, th I think so. I, I think that, I think that um, it's very important and actually just to reference again, the induced seismicity mitigation protocol, doing the right community outreach so everybody knows what you're doing and, and building faith uh, and trust with the communities you're working in is really important. Um, geothermal, if you look at the numbers, has a great track record in the U.S. where people that live local to geothermal plants um, are typically highly supportive of the work that goes on there because it's great for local development. It's in contrast to other resources. It has, you know, low, low pollution, a low land footprint. It's not intrusive. And so there's a long track, rec track record of, of communities being very excited about geothermal development for all the benefits it brings. Um, but that's certainly reliant on trust and faith in the community. So Fervo endeavors to, you know, everywhere we operate, do, do so in ways that we're 
transparent, um, meeting all regulations, exceeding all regulations, and continuing to build off this great degree of trust that the geothermal community has built up over the last several years. Um, but it's a super important, it's a very important question to, to focus about. And if you're not paying attention to your local stakeholders, then um, you're really not doing product development right. Right. Here's a, a follow up as yeah. the, the person was nuts. Well, I guess maybe in addition to thinking about <laughs> induced seismicity, but also just fracking. If people are against fracking, are they going to say, oh, you're going to do that? For, well, then I don't want it. I, yeah, I think that's also a risk. I think that what, what you look at what we do and how geothermal operates, it's so different from what the oil and gas industry um, calls fracking, just in terms of the materials that are used, the goal of it, everything that, that it's, it's not really the right to put us in the same bucket as them. And uh, there's a whole host of reasons for that. But I mean, one of the things is to just to think about it, at the end of the day, geothermal is a system where you bring up uh, the natural reservoir fluid, you run it through your heat exchanger and then inject it back down. So you have you're basically closed loop at the surface. And during that operations phase, you're actually re-injecting and circulating that fluid. And the only thing you're getting out of the resource really is the heat, which is quite a bit different from oil and gas, where you're focused a lot of times on extracting the hydrocarbons that are there. And, and, it, and it's a very different in terms of its profile and how it's operated. And as a result, has an entirely different set of risks and, and technical challenges that are quite distinct from the oil and gas industry. So there's a lot we can learn. There's a lot of benefit to working together, but it's just something that's very important to remember that it's quite a bit different from, from what oil and gas does. Um, well, speaking of oil and gas, maybe Carrie, this is a good time to tackle a couple slides here on, on the recent. Yeah, we'll uh, just wrap it up on this. Yeah. Cool. So there's a couple things, and, and actually, I, I, I tweet a lot. I, if anybody, the, the community that tweets on energy is, is a really fantastic community. I would encourage anyone interested in the topic to get on Twitter and follow people. And, and I actually tweeted something about oil prices uh, recently, and, and Carrie had asked me to maybe include a little bit of it in here. And so clearly, everybody, if you're in Texas, you know, uh, and, and elsewhere as well, that in addition to a lot of disruption going on because of coronavirus and the impacts of that, the other thing that's happening that's going to have a big impact on our economy here is, um, is the crash in oil prices. And so uh, in recent weeks, the price of oil crashed, um, and currently WTI is in the mid-20s. And if you go back to 2012, when I started my career, quite a bit different picture. The day I started my, my career in the oil and gas industry, oil was still over $100. Um, and I worked my way through the downturn in 2014 and 2015 and kind of witnessed firsthand what it was like. Um, and you saw prices climb back a little bit, but now we're crashed again to levels that we haven't seen in a couple of decades. And uh, there's been a lot of really great work in terms of understanding what the price of oil does for renewable energy in general in the clean energy transition. And, you know, one general thing I'll highlight is that it's not really the price of oil that impacts electricity transition. It's um, the price of natural gas. And so oil, at least in the United States, is not really used for electricity generation, except in very small cases, whereas natural gas is our largest source of electricity. And so oil prices won't really have a, a big impact on the supply and demand. It's really natural gas prices. And interestingly, natural gas prices, at least in the U.S., um, over the last decade have shared very little correlation with um, oil prices. And actually, because of so much associated gas that comes in the Permian Basin now, there's actually a compelling argument to be made that natural gas prices are going to be uh, inversely correlated with oil prices. So natural gas prices might go up when oil prices go down. And so that's the important thing to remember about the supply demand dynamic um, on the seller side, on the, the clean, on the clean electricity sales side. But in contrast to renewables like wind and solar, another dynamic where geothermal is highly related to oil and gas is oil field services. So because we're drilling deep wells and we're drilling wells that look a lot like wells in the oil and gas industry, the same drilling rigs and pumps and valves and piping that the oil and gas industry uses is also the, the um, equipment that geothermal uses when we're drilling our wells. And we partner with many of the same companies for it. And if you look, the chart I put here on the left is uh, the correlation between rig count in the United States and oil prices. And you see the last downturn, 2014-15, uh, we were actually operating around 1,600 drilling rigs in America. And when the price crashed, that went all the way down into the 300s. Um, and it's recovered moderately up into the 7 and 800s um, until very recently. But uh, what that means is just a few years ago, we were operating 
1,600 rigs. And now what analysts are saying in terms of the price crash is that number might go down to the 300s or even the 200s. And so if, if it's at the 200s and you think about years ago, we were at 1,600, that means something like 80% of the drilling rigs that are available in the United States are actually going to be in storage and not being utilized. And that's a good approximation for other um, services in the value chain, whether it's pumps or trucks or whatever it is that the oil and gas industry uses, a lot of that activity is going to fall off as well. Um, and it's unfortunately going to be really devastating to a lot of communities and economic and that, that rely on oil field services. Um, and it's one of the things that presents an interesting opportunity for geothermal because since we share in the supply chain costs falling for oil and gas development also mean costs for geothermal um, development fall. And if the rig count goes down into the 200s, the price for services equipment that, that we need might fall by as much as 30 to 40%. And a rough rule of thumb to think about with geothermal development is about half the cost is in drilling the wells and half the cost is in building the power plant. And so our cost structure, about half of it, is going to be directly impacted by this and might decline by 30 to 40 percent. So I've taken a stab at looking at recent developments in terms of what's happened just since the start of this year. Other kind of midpoint numbers, estimations that have a lot of assumptions that go into them. So, so remember that. But at the beginning of the year, we thought a reasonable estimate for the price of geothermal might be something around $76 a megawatt hour um, for all the drilling and the subsurface costs and everything else. And we modeled out what's the impact of a 25% reduction in drilling costs. Um, and because it impacts so much of our cost structure, that actually drops the price right off the bat by $10 a megawatt hour. And then interestingly, in December, there was a partial extension of the investment tax credit for geothermal. And compared to where we were last year, that alone drops the price by perhaps another $4 a megawatt hour if you hold the returns constant. And then the other thing, renewable energy projects are very capital intensive, but since there's no fuel requirements to keep the power plants running, whether it's wind or solar or geothermal, um, there's, there's very little operating costs going on. And so it actually makes renewable projects highly sensitive to interest rates. And as the economy has gone into a downturn, interest rates have fallen significantly. So the LIBOR rate used in, in London, which is a good benchmark rate for a lot of lending, has actually fallen by about 2%. And if you model what that means to still get the same adjusted return on a cash flow basis, that further drops prices by another $5 or so. And so if a medical project would have cost $75 um, uh, at the beginning of the year, using the same assumptions, you might now be below 60. And I think this is a really exciting thing as more and more markets in the U.S. and more and more corporations think about decarbonizing because it got a lot cheaper. And the other thing to think about is we were signing a little bit of contracts for geothermal in the United States at $70, but there was a lot that could have been developed at perhaps $80 or $90 that now this same thing will happen. So a project that might have cost $85 a few months ago might now be down in that $70 range where you'll find um, a strong market to, to pick it up. So it's it's one of those things that you know, Fervo was started from the beginning um, with people to try to tap into the great base of talent that the oil and gas industries developed, the great engineering skills, the great research institutions around oil and gas, and find a way for, the, for those things to be applied to clean energy. And I think that's more important now than ever as the oil price comes down and you're going to see activity levels for oil and gas fall back, that we have this really interesting opportunity for those same drilling rigs, those same geologists, those same research institutions to focus on geothermal um, as a way to, to, to apply those same skills to something that's going to be part of the clean energy transition. And geothermal is small today, but um, we believe it can be such a huge part of the economy in the future that it's very worth the time to make that investment, you know, across the board from the government to companies, to research institutions to bring this industry up because it could be a huge part of the electricity mix in the future and do so in a way that taps into, um, a lot of engineering talent and skills that have been developed for many decades. Um, so that's just my comment on, on oil. Um, maybe I'll end with one more question, which is related to maybe the cost you showed there at the end. Uh, you're going to have several wells, he said, maybe average four to five megawatts and, and the power plant itself is perhaps a 50% of the cost, as you said. So mm -hmm. um, how big is the power plant? Would you, would you build one power plant for all wells or how would you, it's, it's, it's interesting, Ge geothermal facilities, you can find them down in the range of just a few hundred kilowatts in, in extreme off-grid cases or otherwise. 
uh, and all the way up to the scale of one gigawatt. If you go to Northern California, a plant called the Geysers, which is in Sonoma County, uh, produces right around one gigawatt and has for about 50 years. And so you find a huge range of plants within that. Um, but what you see is even at a place like the Geysers, um, it's not one giant one gigawatt plant. It's actually a field where there's around 30 plants and the right size for a geothermal facility ends up being usually in the 20 to 40 megawatt range. So what you would do, do is drill a set of wells and then locate a centralized geothermal power station uh, to try to get that, that right, right in that sweet spot. And we think that's the right size is anywhere from 20 to 40 megawatts. And you would actually just build out a large number of modular units in that size if you wanted to have a larger field. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Tim, thank you. I thought it was a great talk full of information. And uh, thank you for presenting at the Energy Symposium and uh, hope to see you on campus sometime. Yeah, thanks for having me and, and very, very excited to be here. And we'll, we'll definitely be looking forward to coming in person to visit the University of Texas in the near future. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye.